Welcome to the Point of No Return podcast, a show at the intersection of technology and strategy. On this show, we interview industry leaders and experts to better understand how they think about strategy during this time of exponential progress. Hey everyone, welcome to the Point of No Return podcast. Today's show uh, is a very special one. We spoke with Craig Button, a CEO at SportsLogic. I have to say it was the first time I had a former Olympian on the show. <laughs> and I was pretty humbled to have uh, Craig take some time uh, to sit down and talk with me in the SportsLogic office. Uh, he's built a very interesting company uh, and we dove into it quite a bit on, on the show. A little bit on his background, uh, he's a former Canadian pair skater. Uh, he uh, has built a company called SportLogic, which is an AI-powered sports analytics company, which is making a lot of waves uh, in, in the country right now. Uh, with his former partner, Megan Duhamel, uh, he's the Can- 2009 Canadian silver medalist and 2008-2010 bronze medalist. Uh, with Valérie Marcou, he's represented Canada at 2006 Winter Olympics, where he placed 11th. Uh, on the show, uh, we spoke a little bit about his Olympic career, uh, but specifically how he went from the world of uh, sport competition to the world of tech startups and some of the parallels that, that he was, he's been able to draw. Uh, the power of education in his quest, uh, how failure has built, has helped him build more character and resilience. Uh, the guy also works super hard. There's no luck <laughs> in, in what he's done. Uh, we spoke a little bit about the work that's went into building sport logic. Uh, we spoke a lot about the predictive power of data in sports. It's a, it's a nascent field. Uh, he also got a certain Mark Cuban to invest in a startup, and that's a great story. Uh, and then finally, we spoke about a lot of the opportunities for growth at sport logic. Craig is really an impressive leader uh, from competing at the world uh, the world's highest level to creating a, a really interesting groundbreaking company. This conversation was truly inspiring and I hope that you enjoy the conversation. Craig, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate your time. And uh, like I said, right before we started recording, first Olympian I've ever had. So I'm <laughs> super psyched. <laughs> I guess my first question, um, is there anything you miss about competing on the ice? Wow. So I, um, I was actually just talking about this the other day. So there's, uh, when I got out of sport, uh, so Olympians tend to, when, you know, you retire out of this four year cycle and suddenly you head out of sport and into the real world. Um, I, I initially went out kind of going, okay, I'm no longer training. I'm no longer working towards this one single goal. Um, and started in the business world and just felt completely lost. I mean, you, you know, you're stepping away from your entire network, all of your friends, everybody that you know in sport, and you get into this world where, you know, you're no longer at the end of a great performance, no longer having 10,000 people standing up and cheering for you. And, you know, um, it took probably about three, four years to really kind of get my feet back under me and to figure out, you know, how to have uh, the tools to actually work in the normal world. Um, but I've got to say that now in, here at SportLogic, I mean, we're, we're now a team of 47. I'm working with some of the most dedicated, passionate people that I've worked with in, a, you know, in, in years. Uh, and I can say that from an objective place that I've worked with Olympians. <laughs> so, um, as it stands today, no. Uh, but I can tell you that after sport, it was it was difficult to get back and, yeah. and get. Uh, and there, do you find that there are any? And I imagine there's a lot of differences, right? Like you don't have the instant, let's say, um, I don't think gratification, but the instant, let's say, knowledge of success, right? Like you win, you win, you lose. It's kind of an instant thing. But if you wake up in the morning, you go to work, you don't necessarily know if you did something good <laughs> when you came back home that night. What are the, let's say, the, the traits that you find are most useful that you learned during your time in sport? So it's, it's funny, you know, the, um, the startup world is actually quite similar to being an athlete. I mean, there is that you have to win or you're going, you know, win everything or lose everything, right? Uh, you don't get that in, in the normal corporate world. You, you have your objectives and you, you know, work on a yearly basis. And, uh, in the startup world, you really do go in these sort of, you know, quarterly, yearly sprints. And at the end of them, you're either going onward and upward to massive success or you are just crashing and burning. Uh, so in some sense, I actually do feel very similar to, to how I did as an athlete. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but, uh, 
<laughs> no, but it's a good it's a good analogy, right? Like sometimes, especially in the early stage, right? Like, and I, I know you guys have raised funding, right? Like, you, you either become a smashing success or there's a you know a smoking crater left in the ground. So percent. That's exactly. You kind of yeah. have no choice but to win. Yep. With air quotes. Yep. Um, do you feel that uh, in in terms of your training or your past track record, what would you say in terms of your personality? Um, has you know has you know what do you credit in terms of your personality that has led you to like your current success today well there's a couple things you learn um one as an athlete and i mean i was a former figure skater right so the, as an athlete i learned dedication i learned hard work i learned how to push myself harder than i could ever imagine um and as a figure skater i learned creativity i, I learned how to sort of um you know approach very technically difficult things with an artistic you know edge uh, and I think that creative side has actually brought a lot to what we're doing, both strategically in our products, in our design, in, in everything that we, we do here. Um, and so that combination of, of things uh, has really allowed me to kind of step into this role um, and, and kind of be in my, my comfort mm-hmm. zone here. How do you look at failure? Because I imagine when you're doing sport, you have you don't have just a big apparent failures on television. I imagine <laughs> sometimes you, have, you do, <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you have the mini ones, right? In training yeah. and like you know the the early mornings on a weekend that people don't always see, right? Like yeah. you you aren't able to achieve it. Do you find that 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 constant getting up and dusting yourself off uh, is that applicable to the startup world? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, so there if if. There's sort of this uh, scale of talent versus hard work. Um, and I was generally more on the hard work than I was on the talent as, as an athlete. Um, and I, I think that's one of the reasons that I made it is just I was always willing to kind of go that extra mile, go that extra hour. Um, you know, when I was young, I moved to the right center at the right time and I worked more hours than anybody else in, at that center. Uh, and I think, you know, I failed more than, more than most athletes fail. You know, when I was, when I was 19 years old, I was like 20th in some tiny competition in the middle of Alberta. You know, like I was objectively a terrible skater at one point in my life. Um, but just continuing to persevere and to find the right little wins along the way, um, and sort of, you know, continue to get knocked down without, losing momentum. Uh, and I think as a startup, that's, if you look at the number of iterations we've had in our products and in our, um, in everything that we've offered, um, you know, the vision today is nothing what it was, you know, three (laughs) years ago. Uh, and that's because, you know, we, most of the things that we tried early on failed and the little things that work, we built on them. Hmm. Uh, and it's, it's really no different when you look at it, uh, from that perspective. Yeah. So I love that analogy, right? Like falling on the ice (laughs) quite, quite figuratively. (laughs) Uh, and then using that similar approach to when it comes to startup and innovating and p- pivoting to, to different approaches. Uh, is there anything that you do personally to, as CEO of the company to keep thinking about how do I keep learning? How do I keep getting up from these mini failures, let's say? Well, you know, I, I worked um, as a skater. It was, it was in Paris. It was a team sport, right? And, and there were times when my partner was down and there were times when I was down. My partner would, you know, help lift me up. Um, and I think anytime we've had a failure here as a company, um, what will, what I try to do is be as, as open and transparent with the team as, as possible, bring everybody in and say, look, this is where we were going. This is, you know, this goal was unbelievably high. We missed this goal, but guess what? Here are the three things that we learned along the way. Here's what we actually gained and here's how much further we are ahead in this opportunity. And I think by, by being open with the team and by explaining, you know, where the failures are and where the little points of excitement are and where we're going next, I think people kind of bring, bring that, uh, you know, build on that as well with, with me. Um, so I like to think that that's what, uh, what I've taken from yeah. sport. <laughs> so I guess the big question is that, so going back in your past and like, so you, you finished sport, you had a few years to say, re- 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 reorient yourself. Uh, how did you get the idea for sport logic? How did it come about? <laughs> well, so I, um, Jeez. So yeah, I, I got, got out of sport in 2010. Um, I had started a small coffee company on my own. I had sort of funded a, and built this, this little sort of project, um, and realized, um, after a few months that I needed some kind of education. I had no idea how to run a business. I just knew how to work hard. Um, and so built, built that company up. Uh, I ended up 
signing up for a couple of night courses. And while I was going to sign up, uh, somebody at McGill said, well, why don't you try applying for the MBA program? Um, you know, and I said, look, I've been out of school for 12 years. Um, I don't have a background in business. I don't know, you know, I didn't, I don't know anything that all these people know from their undergrad degrees. Uh, and they said, look, we, we make an exception. Uh, in some cases, you've clearly got some life experience. You're clearly motivated. You know, they were looking at some of the products that, that I had put together. Um, I wrote the GMAT. Uh, McGill made an exception and they let me in despite not having an undergrad degree. Uh, and so I ended up basically, you know, um, heading into that MBA program, uh, almost straight out of sport. Now, the first year, uh, I was doing a uh, really full-time MBA and while building the company on my own. Uh, and so I learned a lot about applying a lot of the, the theoretical um, university research to, to business. Um, sold that company in the last year uh, and ended up essentially having um, a semester of almost nothing to do. Sort of, I've got, I had six credits remaining and uh, I ended up doing an independent study. And basically the topic was really, you know, what am I going to do next in my life? Uh, and at that time, uh, the independent study looked at a couple of things. Uh, it looked at um, what the big challenges are in the world today and what are the, you know, the th things that we're going to have to tackle over the next 20 years or more. Um, and what the big innovation, um, breakthroughs innovate, like, um, you know, at the time it was, it was neural nets. It was, um, machine learning was sort of just starting, um, you know, what big pieces of technology are happening right now that are going to affect various industries. So essentially it's like, what are the problems? What are the tech and where can those pieces marry? Um, and so <laughs> sort of the long story <laughs> to get to the answer, but, uh, uh, I ended up looking at, um, at, you know, one of the things I was looking at at the time was self-driving vehicles uh, and looking at computer vision technologies that were in that. And initially, the idea was to come out of university and start a self-driving vehicle company. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's where this started. <laughs> not ambitious at all. Right? <laughs> so I was like, hey, why not, right? <laughs> so... Um, at that time, I had uh, I had met my uh, my co-founder, Marcin Javan, who was working. Uh, he was just defending his PhD uh, in at McGill as well. Uh, he was doing activity recognition in single camera video footage. Um, basically, his technology um, found anomalies in human movement. Uh, and so at the time, cars were trying to drive themselves, and all they were seeing was you know a stop sign or a line on the road or a parked car. And the ability to see and understand human movement and interaction around the cars just didn't exist. So I was like, cool, let's, let's really work on that technology, that one piece, you know, the, the ability to understand how human beings are moving and how they're interacting with each other so that a car can stop itself if there's a, you know, a seven year old on a bike in front of the car. Um, and so we started working on that with that, that uh, idea and realized very quickly that uh, neither one of us knew anything about cars. <laughs> uh, I happen to know a lot about sport. And so we, we basically started building the tech in sport and, you know, kind of crossed our fingers that that would go somewhere. Yeah. Did you have the, uh, the idea uh, at the beginning to look at analytics and to say, okay, if we can look, look at some patterns from players on the ice or on the field, we can then predict X, Y, Z, or was it a bit more embryonic? They're like, Hey, we, we know there's, there's this technology that works. There's this field that doesn't use any technology. Let's just experiment and see what happens. Uh, a little bit of both. I mean, it was, I, just coming from the sport world, I knew what was missing. I knew the types of things that we were writing down by hand or the types of things that were sort of decisions that were being made on gut feel. So I had a sense of what was missing on the sport side. But really what we were trying to do is actually create just sort of a testing ground to build the technology. I mean, we, we saw this as a tech that would, that would actually work for self-driving vehicles, for security surveillance, for retail, for, you know, 101 other industries. And we just saw this, you know, when you apply computer vision to a field where there are lines on the ice and they're measured and the guys have numbers on their backs, <laughs> it's like this perfect little testing ground for something that you want to build. And we actually saw it as, okay, this is great. This is a test bed for the tech. It was never, um, it was never specifically to do a, a one individual metric or any kind of analytic. It was just, that was a, a way to build the technology. And fast forward to, day, to today, how would you describe what sport logic does? So we do um, think of, you know, um, we have a series of technologies that can see and describe uh, the game the same way that a person does. Uh, so we track the movements of every player, every motion on the ice or on the court or on the field 30 times a second. Uh, so if anybody's ever seen uh, 3D motion capture, uh, 
uh, we capture that same type of information, but from video in game. Uh, so, you know, if you go back and see the old Bobby Orr footage of him flying through the ice or flying, you know, after he makes the, the goal, we could pause that and scroll around in 3d through that scene. So we're, we're reconstructing the scene in 3d. Um, yeah. So that's essentially what we're doing on the yeah. computer vision side. And what does that unlock in terms of like things that people didn't know about? Well, uh, so in so doing, we capture every pass, every pass reception, every shot, every line carry, every block, every stick check, every body check. Uh, we're building out a 4,000 line play by play of what happens in the game, in addition to the location of all the players at all times. Uh, so if you wanted to talk about shot quality, I mean, you would have every pass and every line carry that led to a shot in a certain location. And then you also have all of the, um, the X, Y coordinates of every other player around. So that shot has a particular sort of, um, uh, thumbprint, right? It's a certain type of shot with a certain type of difficulty. So you can begin to separate how good the goalie is versus the defense. You can begin to describe what type of player, um, you know, a, a defensive forward versus an offensive forward. And you can start. Uh, comparing players with different skill sets to other players with those same skill sets. Uh, so traditionally, analytics has been, um, you know, you look at baseball, you have all of these discrete events. You've got a, a pitch and a hit and a run, right? Uh, in hockey or soccer or basketball, the game is much more fluid. And there, you know, um, there's no one specific metric that is will give you a, an answer to everything. Um, there's so many codependencies that it's just, it's next to impossible to... Weather, I imagine, as well sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. And so being able to measure everything essentially gives you the ability to describe anything. So in terms, I can, I, so, uh, first of all, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, I spent some time on your website and it looks like you guys capture this plethora of metrics and you, your customers today are on the media side and on the uh, team side, right? So Correct. you sell predominantly to say, if I'm like the Montreal Canadiens and I want to figure out how to turn around this losing season, well, I'd use your software to be able to coach my players to, to interact Yep. Not just generally, but also against specific adversaries. Like here's how the Washington Capitals perform when, you know, their yep. top line is on the ice, right? Yep. Is that the main use case? Like in terms of like, why would someone pay for your software? Yeah. So there, there are two ways that the teams are using it. Uh, we currently, so we've been alive now for uh, a little over three years. We've signed on 24 teams in the NHL. Um, so, you know, almost three quarters of the league is, is using, using our stuff. Uh, they use it in two different ways. Uh, one is on a daily basis, looking at the game they just played or, you know, the game that's upcoming. So pregame, postgame reports. Um, oftentimes teams will have specific, um, you know, custom metrics that they want to look at, uh, maybe sequences of events that they, they describe as a, a system that they're looking to measure. So you can measure the number of times that system is played. How effective is it against various teams? Um, and then on the trading and the drafting side as well, um, we, our data essentially describes the players the same way that the scouts do. So, you know, um, you're going to, you're going to start to see players that you might not have necessarily noticed before. Um, you're going to be able to compare them against, um, you know, depending on how strong their teammates or their opposition is and actually compare apples to apples across the league. Uh, you can also look at leagues that you've never seen before. So you might look at the SHL and put it on the same platform as the NHL uh, and then compare stylistically one player to another. Um, so it, it sort of levels the playing field and allows the cream to kind of rise to the crop, rise right. to the top. And how far back does your data set go? Can you go back to as, as like the, the beginning of televised sport, essentially? <laughs> yeah, that, that was the objective. So <clears throat> there, there are multi-camera systems that are out there right now. Uh, so companies that put, you know, 12 cameras in a stadium and then they can go back as far as they, you know, they've installed those cameras, right? Uh, our system works with a single camera so we can take, um, you know, standard broadcast feed. So we could essentially go back as far as, as broadcast mm -hmm. sport goes. Um, would we, I'm not sure uh, that, that comes down to ultimately cost and, yeah. and, and, you know, it's not free to process games. Yeah. Uh, and if somebody wants to buy it, we'll do it. Uh, yeah. we recently just processed the 72 summit series actually, and oh, wow. okay. compared those players to the players now. And it was yeah, very, very cool. Is there any takeaway uh, up for, from that? 
Uh, I'm the wrong guy to, to, to tell you what the takeaways are. Okay. Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, on, the, on the aside, that's like a great piece of content marketing, right? Like if you, yeah. if you want that to blow up, right? Like yep. We analyze you know, yep. the Summit series. And- well, it sort of hammers down the point, right? It's, it, the point is we can analyze games with a single camera. And mm-hmm. this is the, the question being, you know, can you do historical footage? Well, if you want the last 10 years from 50 different leagues in soccer, for instance, sure, here you go. Mm-hmm. So that's, that was sort of the, the idea behind it is demonstrating mm-hmm. that we can do it. Yeah. And do you, does your system take into account probability of scoring, right? So like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we are currently predicting game outcomes uh, pre-game uh, with about sixty-seven percent accuracy. No way. Yeah. So depending on the threshold, if yeah. if you wanted to look at fewer number of games, the ones we're yeah. really confident, uh, we go up to seventy-six percent. Yeah. Um, but if you wanted to look at the bulk of games, we're at we're at. Uh, Is there a moment in like the first period or like X, uh, after X number of minutes where that 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 precision goes up. You said like after five minutes of the game, we're like, it looks like it's going to be 95% team white versus team blue, let's say. Uh, or not, we're not it really there depends. Yet. Yeah. Well, no, it, it, it we are, but it, it does depend. So we have, um, what we found is that, um, the, when the game is tied, um, so ultimately, I mean, the, the score is what is going to determine who's going to win the game. Right. Uh, but when the game is tied, there's, um, there's really a, uh, a disconnect in the market between what the odds are out there and, and what we see. Um, so he, when the game is tied, which is, you know, roughly what 30% of, of the game, we, we see, um, we see game outcomes, uh, I think more accurately than most, really most yeah, instead of a with. flip of a coin when it's tied yeah well what we kind of see is is if you're watching the game and you start getting a gut feel that one team is playing more aggressively or they're starting to make moves right these are the kind of things that aren't really quantified elsewhere and so what we're doing is we're picking up on that and we're simply putting numbers mm-hmm. on what most fans would to kind of have a that yeah. that gut feel yeah so when did you realize that you guys were onto something that you're like you know Holy, holy macro. Like we got to do something here. Like the, the software is working or the idea is so powerful and the, the way we're, we're communicating the vision is generating a lot of interest. Like, was there a moment in time or was it just over a period of time that, that, that you saw? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, tough to say because at the moment when we knew, I mean, we knew right away. We were all excited about it. We showed people, look, here's where we're going. And nobody really got it. Everybody mm-hmm. was like, great. That's a lot of information. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think, I think when we, when we, maybe when we made our first sale, that was, that was kind of a big day. Um, and I think when we started seeing, uh, more, more uptake from customers and, and people actually commit dollars. <laughs> so yeah, product stickiness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I guess the killer question, how did you get Mark Cuban involved? Like, so Mark Cuban was a, it was a cold call. Uh, I found his email on, uh, on a like a forum uh, and I just emailed him I said hi Mark my name is Craig uh, here's <laughs> here's the the things that we're working on here's the team uh, here is the you know the here are the patents here's the uh, here's what we're going after um, and I was I was on the metro I think I was in Plastis R metro and I and I got an email from Mark Cuban saying tell me about tell me more about the tech I thought for a minute I thought it was like a, a, a <laughs> joke I'm like oh, okay look this is uh, you know maybe I sent it to the wrong email address this is somebody who's messing with me right <laughs> Some guy from Nigeria. Well, that's it, right? Yeah. A prince who wants somewhere to put his money. That's, <laughs> that's great. That's a great. That's a great story. Um, and did, did he become? Okay, I guess maybe I shouldn't ask if he became a customer or not for his own team. But I can imagine where that conversation led to. Did that? Was that like a, a real validation that okay, you know, someone that's of his of his you know of his stature that wants to invest? Uh, did that validate a lot of the work you guys were doing? Um, yes and no. I think a lot of the validation came more after he, uh, he, he came on board because I mean, he's, you know, actively involved at the time. It was, it was sort of weekly. Uh, and he, I mean, I don't know how many investments he's made, uh, well over a hundred, 150. Uh, and so to be as involved as he was, uh, was kind of like, wow, this is we're we're clearly right in this guy's wheelhouse. Um, and I think he's got sort of a handful of companies that, uh, that we're in touch with relatively consistently. And I mean, these are all companies that I look at and I look, I have a tremendous amount of respect yeah. for. And so I think as that started coming about, it was really just, okay, yes, we, we are uh, in this thing now. Yeah. Um, and I imagine funding has been one of those tools that has helped uh, can accelerate this. Yep. How do you, now that you have a bit more resources based on that, how do you, how do you prioritize your next step? Like how, what, what's the grid, the decision grid that you use to say we're going to do B versus, you know, C? Yeah, it's funny. Um, there's so many, so coming from the NBA, I mean, there, there's so many management frameworks that you can use and you can really analyze, but ultimately, I mean, there, there is a lot of just feel, like just gut feel that you've got when, when there are two opportunities that are very close and there are risks on both sides and opportunities on both sides. Um, 
oftentimes when we get to a point where we have a, uh, you know, a big decision to make, like what sport are we going into next? As an example, um, oftentimes what we'll do is we'll look internally and say, okay, as a team, where are we going to have the most passion and the most, uh, you know, most vigor in, in which, you know, and, and sometimes that might be the thing that flips it. Uh, but yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Sometimes going with your gut feels not, not a bad thing, right? <laughs> Instead of like getting plunked down in Excel sheets for months. Oh no, you do um, both. Don't get me yeah. wrong. <laughs> this yeah. is, I mean, there, there's there's value in um, in planning a tremendous amount of value, and in fact, we're we're consistently planning. Mm. Having a plan, however, I don't think is is as valuable as people yeah. believe it is. Yeah. Uh, I think plans change so quickly, and as long as you're consistently digging in to that Excel spreadsheet and also working with your gut, mm. um, I, I think you, it's it's you have to have both. Hmm. I feel like you guys were in the sports analytics space before it was even called sports analytics. Now it's kind of like the, the <laughs> thing that the uh, talking heads say, should we be doing this or not? Like on TSN, but um, given, I imagine obviously patents gives you an advantage, but what, what else would you say is like an, a core advantage of sport logic today? Well, we've, uh, I, I, I don't know the, I want to say our people for the most part. I mean, we've, I mean, that's a bit cliche. I know kind of everybody says that, but I mean, when, when I got together with, with Mersan, so I was coming from the, the sport world, right? It was just like, we're going to work until we get this thing right. And we are not going to stop. And I don't care if we eat or sleep, we're going. Uh, and Mersan was coming from the PhD world, right? Uh, and so I remember we had a, our first real del deliverable. Um, we had, we'd been together only a few months and we had to get something together. And it was just like, he and I stayed up for two nights. I mean, straight through, uh, to, to get this product out the door and we got it out. And it was in that moment, I'm just like, oh my God, this guy's as much of an animal as, <laughs> as I am or as anybody that I've yeah. worked with is. Uh, and when we brought our first hockey guy, our real hockey guy on board, uh, Chris Boucher, who was, this guy had spent 10 years of his life sitting in front of a computer, sitting in front of a TV screen, watching hockey in slow motion and annotating in Excel what types of events he was <laughs> looking at. Um, and he came in and this guy was putting in 18, 19 hour days the day that he got here. Uh, and so when you see that kind of passion coming from the, the core group when it starts, I mean, I just, I knew we were on to the right path and I knew we were the right team to do it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, the team, I would argue as well, just by our DNA, by the fact that Mersan is uh, coming really from an academic uh, side. I mean, before we even started, he, um, you know, we had secured a half million dollar grant from the Canadian government that we didn't use for ourselves. We funded research. Uh, we went to five universities and funded research projects that we knew were going to be three, four years out. Um, and so that we basically began guiding research that we knew would turn into something. And when we, we were founded as a company, we went to raise the round. It was like, here's where all the IP is going. This is what the entire piece looks like. And here are the universities working on these individual pieces. So it was like, look, if, if these fail, these will succeed. And if these ones fail, these will, and if the whole thing works, look at this big dragon we're slaying. Right. Um, and so, yeah, that's, I would say maybe the IP and the people. Nice. Sort of. <laughs> yeah. Not, not too bad things to bet on for sure. <laughs> Um, so to talk a little bit about the industry. I'd love to hear where you see it heading, right? Like we see, it's, it seems like it's very embryonic. Like even talking about market share is kind of like a nonsense question right now. <laughs> um, is, do you see the trend of like every single sports team adapt, uh, adopting this kind of technology, every single analyst, every single media firm, like where is it going exactly? So there's, there's really three verticals here. There are three things you can do with, with data and sport. Uh, the first is teams, uh, want more information so that they can win more games. Uh, the second is broadcasters. Uh, so whether it's broadcast, digital media, wherever fans are consuming sport, uh, if you can tell better stories, if you can tell automated stories, if you can show graphics and insights on the game. Uh, and then the third and the obvious side is the sports betting side. I mean, there's when you have this, when you're able to predict game outcome, you're going to be able to, um, you know, generate more efficient lines. Uh, and so, I see our technology as being something that can enable uh, more efficient, uh, you know, greater efficiency across all three of those verticals. Uh, in addition, just enabling products that people haven't yet imagined. Hmm. What do you think is happening in the space right now that's not getting enough attention or, or is not spoken about at all? Uh, in the space, uh, if it's I, yeah. Sports analytics specifically. Sports analytics specifically. Um, there are a couple of companies doing interesting things. I, I think some of the machine learning AI stuff is, uh, is underrated right now. I think they're, they're really 
people think it's going to do one thing, but really it's actually going to do a whole bunch of other things that people ha- aren't, don't really have their eyes on. Um, I think the idea of sports analytics, and I'm using air quotes under the table right now, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sports analytics is a little bit overrated right now. I think there's a lot of companies doing manual, uh, manual data collection and doing basic correlation among data. Um, I think machine learning is going to uh, allow us just to do unimaginable things, uh, and, and soon. I mean, within the next, you know, two to three years. Um, the f- interesting thing about that statement, I think, is that um, there's also um, the barriers to entry to get into machine learning and to get into AI are lowering really by the day. And I think within within five years, you're going to be able to see any startup anywhere with uh, with a bit of motivation being able to do things that right now are taking years to build. Um, and so I think with the amount of data being collected and the ability to analyze motion and, and uh, patterns. Um, I just, with five years, I, I just think this whole industry is going to flip on its head. So do you think that that represent like a massive opportunity for you guys, like to be the front runner oh, yeah. or will it be the, the danger of becoming a commodity? If it, if like the cost becomes zero, then yeah, well it's, there's, there's two things, right? There's the data collection and then there's the analysis. And this is where you're starting to see a lot of, um, uh, push towards being the official data supplier of X League, right? So the in the same way that media rights have, uh, you have to be the official, um, you know, video provider of the Premier League in order to be able to to show those games. Uh, the value is going to there. There will be a gatekeeper at at that point in being able to generate data. Um, so being able to collect it and then being able to analyze it, those are two very different things. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. <laughs> Um, considering like so many different options in front of you, what's, what does the future hold for SpurLogic? What are you guys planning to do at least in the next 12 months? So we're, we have a couple of things we want to do. Um, the first, so we, we've spent this last uh, sort of two seasons showing that we can collect data and, and understand hockey data. Uh, we did that. I mean, it, the, the story and the narrative makes sense because we're Canadian and you know we know sport. Uh, we know hockey, right? Um, but ultimately in starting in hockey gave us this really interesting, um, platform basically as, as sort of a, a beachhead to, to get into, to sport in general. Uh, we didn't step on any of the big competitors toes. We built interesting product that couldn't be developed by competitors elsewhere. And we're now in a position where we're ready to scale across sport. Um, and so the, one of the biggest leaps we're making right now is moving into, into some of the larger market sports globally. Um, where the tech that we've built gives us an advantage and now we're we're running with it yeah i was i'm gonna take a guess at uh, one of the sports that starts with s and finishes with ocker yeah. uh, <laughs> depends where you are it might start with f and end with football <laughs> <laughs> um greg this has been great i don't want to keep more of your time i guess one last question is where can people find out more about what you guys are doing at sport logic yeah so uh sportlogic.com is your best bet uh our stuff's out there on facebook as well um we're going to have some really interesting fan products in the next little while so uh so keep (laughs) keep your eyes peeled nice thank you so much for your time Greg. thank you thank you for listening to the point of no return podcast Never miss an episode by clicking on the subscribe button on iTunes or Google Play.